Uh, this is our third week going through apologetic stuff, uh, and we're going to be in this for a while. Uh, first week was just intro to apologetics, and then second week, last week, was an intro to the biblical canon. Can somebody remind me just what we're talking about whenever we talk about the canon of the Bible? The standard. Standard, but what, what specifically do we have in mind? The measurements of the standard, right? Like a ruler. Yes, but what specifically do we have in mind? When I say the canon of the Bible, what am I referring to? Separation. The six, the, the books. Yes, the books, right? The 66 books of the Bible. Oh, right? yeah, and you talked about, like, three different kinds. You know, but... Well, yes, so we talked about different definitions, but all of them are in reference to the 66 books of the Bible. So if you ever hear somebody using the term canon in regards to the Bible, they're talking about the books, right? And what belongs in the Bible, right? What books specifically? Uh, today what we're going to do is we are going to start addressing the Old Testament canon, uh, and we're not going to go super in-depth into this one. Uh, we're, my goal today is to get through the entire Old Testament canon today. Uh, whereas the New Testament canon, uh, we're going to go a little bit more in-depth into. Uh, and the reason why is simply because we have a lot more information in regards to the New Testament canon and how it came to be developed. Uh, and that, that's simply because of how more it was written a lot rec more recently. right? The New Testament canon was written in a short time period in the first century A.D., Right, so that's just 2,000 years ago. The Old Testament canon was, it took like a 1,000 years to basically become what it was. Uh, and How many it, years for the New Testament? New Testament canon, I mean, it was written over the course of Five. less than 100 years. Oh, uh, it, was, it was written over the course of less than 100 years. Uh, and so, um, and as a result, though, we have a lot more, like, simply by the nature of the early Christian church, because it so rapidly expanded, they're having to have more conversations about this stuff so we can actually see, you know, how people throughout the church are trying to handle what books belong in the New Testament. Whereas with the Old Testament, you're dealing with a the same community living in the same region. And so a lot of the discussions they probably had, we just don't have evidence of, if that makes sense. Um, but we are going to address what stuff we do have today. Uh, and we're going to just address... Um, exactly how it seems to be that the Old Testament canon came to be. And so when we're talking about the Old Testament canon, we are talking about the 39 books of the Old Testament, right? Genesis to Malachi. And so, um, first and foremost, uh, we need to ask the question, how did we get the Old Testament canon? Uh, and just questions of the evidence of development. And I hate to disappoint you, but right off the bat, I'm going to tell you, we don't have a clear play-by-play -play outline of how the Old Testament canon was developed, However, from the information we do have, we can make a few assertions. Um, what I mean by that is that there is no single source um, that we get from the Jewish community where they just say, hey, here's exactly how we got the 39 books in the Old Testament. Um, first, Genesis was agreed upon at this date. We don't have anything like that, right? Instead, what we do have is we have some discussions going on um, both internally and externally in regards to the development of this canon. Uh, and the historical events in it. Yes. Um, so, real quick, let me just go back a little bit. We talked about the three definitions of canon, right? Um, we talked about the ontological definition, the functional definition, and the exclusive definition. As we go through this discussion, we're going to be using all three of those, really. Right? Ontological definition of canon. That's basically saying that something becomes canonical simply by its nature because it is God-breathed, right? Well, from that perspective, the canon came to exist as soon as it was written. And so we're really not addressing that question here um, because we would say as soon as Moses finished writing Genesis, Genesis was canon, right? We're more talking about the second two definitions, right? Functional definition is when did people start using this as canon, right? When did they start treating it as authoritative? And then the exclusive definition would be when was it officially recognized universally as canonical, right? Uh, those are the two questions we're mainly addressing, and so we're kind of addressing the human element of things today, right? And so we don't have a clear, like, just resource that just tells us, hey, um, this is when the Jewish people recognize these 39 books. Instead, we have other resources that kind of help us figure that stuff out. Uh, it's almost like a puzzle that you're putting together, if that makes sense. Uh, and so, the first thing we can say is this. Despite how many skeptics present it, there was never a moment in history where a bunch of powerful people gathered together with a hidden agenda to decide which books ought to be banned or forbidden. 
Uh, the main reason I put this clarification is actually less for the Old Testament and more for the New Testament, but it's still worth mentioning here. Um, whenever people talk about how the biblical canon came to be, um, and we'll, we're actually going to address specific examples of this when we talk about the New Testament canon, but whenever people talk about how it came to be, people on the more skeptical side of things, uh, people who are more quick to criticize Christianity, um, they will often... Uh, make a caricature of this development by saying, oh, well, there are a bunch of really powerful people who got together in a room and they voted on which books made it into the Bible. We have no historical evidence of anything like that ever happening. That's all I'm asserting right here. Um, you will see them more claiming that with the New Testament than the Old Testament, but it's still worth pointing out. We don't have anything like that with the Old Testament either. Um, despite what is often claimed, the Old Testament was not nearly transmitted orally for hundreds and hundreds of years before being written down. In many cases, we have evidence of things being recorded almost immediately. Uh, this is another thing that's kind of important for us. Um, and this is actually something that's probably more relevant to the Old Testament than it is to the New Testament. Uh, because with the New Testament, it's pretty clear that these things were written down pretty quickly. You all have some skeptics who try to suggest that you can't even trust what the Gospels say because they were written down decades after the time of Christ but they're written down by people who experienced him, right? And so I think that those people are kind of overstating their case there, and they're suggesting that oral transmission can't work. But you will see this claimed a lot more with the Old Testament, right? Uh, well, they'll say, you know what? How do we even know that what's written down there is what actually happened? Because this stuff, it was passed down orally for hundreds and hundreds of years, and you can't trust oral tradition. Um, what I'm pointing out here is that Ultimately, you can just escape that argument because we have evidence that that's not how this was created. Um, but even if it was that way, right, let's just act like the skeptics were right. And let's say that hypothetically, these orally, like, like these things were transmitted orally for hundreds and hundreds of years before they were written down. I don't think that would necessarily suggest that things weren't trustworthy. Um, usually, once again, skeptics will make a caricature of this and they'll say, have you ever played a game of telephone? You know, have you ever played the game of telephone before? Yes. You know, this is where somebody, like, whispers somebody in somebody's ear, and then, like, you go around the circle, and, like, you see what it becomes at the very end. Um, usually, this is how skeptics will present it. They'll say, oh, well, if you ever played a game of telephone, you know how unreliable oral transmission is, right? In oral tradition, you just can't trust it. But there's a few issues where that, like, there's a few reasons why that is a false representation of what oral tradition actually looks like. Right? Can you all think of any uh, reasons why? Whispering versus, like, actually, t like, like, maybe even yelling if you're, like, talking to the crowd, like, a yeah. story and making sure that people understand what you're saying very clearly. Yeah, so the very nature of the game Telephone, you're literally whispering it into somebody's ear, you're only allowed to say it once, they're not allowed to repeat it, and then they have to immediately say it to the next person, right? Well, that's already different than what we're talking about when we talk about old tradition. In addition to that... You're playing a game, right? In the so game of telephone, people yeah. literally, like, the goal is to kind of mess it up, mm -hmm. right? And usually people will start, like, the first phrase that you say will be intentionally misleading because they're trying to get it to mess up by the end, right? And because it's a game, people don't take it as seriously, right? So there's many reasons why that's a false analogy. But even in addition to that, you have to realize that we don't listen as much nowadays as people did in the past, right? For instance, I'm a teacher. Right? And the expectation on me as a teacher nowadays is way different than it was on teachers back in like the 1920s, right? Or back in the 1800s or even earlier, right? Nowadays, um, we've kind of made it to where teachers spoon feed their kids, right? To where if they have to give an assignment, what you do is you write what the assignment is on the board, you type out a syllabus, <laughs> you give them the, basically the rubric for grading, and then in addition to all that, you have to type it up online so that the parents can access this information uh, so that really, whenever you announce the assignment in class, usually the kids don't listen. Why do the kids not listen? You got so many things to fall back on. Yeah, like cause the kids know, oh, well, even though I'm not listening in class, this is going to be online. He's going to remind me on the board. I can just go online and my parents can access this. And so usually we kids... Got pictures and just, got oh, no, exactly, right? We just take pictures of stuff, right? Uh, and so nowadays... Um, we've made it to where we spoon feed this stuff to the kids to where they don't pay attention to class, right? Well, that's a problem. Uh, and nowadays, we are so literate that 
you know, we just take it for granted that things are always at access. Like we always have access to it, right? I mean, I don't need to memorize my Bible because guess what? I can just pull out my phone and there it is, right? I don't even need to know Greek or Hebrew. I can just pull up an app and I've got access to that, right? So in many ways, technological advances and accessibility have made it to where we listen a lot less because we don't have to, right? Okay, but let's go back just to like the 1900s. Uh, like, like, like early 1900s, right? Like 1920s, 1910s. Okay, whenever a teacher was going to give an assignment, would the would they have access to you know Blackboard or Canvas to be able to access? No, no. no. If if a teacher gave you an assignment, you better listen quickly, and, <laughs> and you have to remember it because you're going to be held to that expectation, and you're not going to get it repeated to you again and again, right? If you go back even earlier, the demands become even higher. Right? And so earlier cultures, they knew how to listen a lot better. If you go back into biblical times, you have to realize that most people didn't even know how to read. Right? Most people didn't know how to read or write. That's something we take for granted nowadays. But if you don't know how to read or write, how is it that you learn stuff? By listening. By listening. You have to memorize it. Right? That's why whenever you encounter like most of the Jews in like New Testament time period, they can just cite scripture by memory. Right? Paul, whenever he's like writing the book of Romans... He doesn't have like all these scrolls open up next to him whenever he's quoting the Old Testament because that would have been so expensive. It's not like Paul could like afford to have his entire Old Testament as he's traveling around. Oh, George. Um, that would have just cost so much money, right? Because keep in mind, those are being handwritten, right? They didn't have a printing press, right? And so people back in the day, most of them weren't literate. And even if you were literate, books cost a lot more money nowadays than they do, or back then than they do nowadays. Nowadays, you can get a book for like $3. Not the case if somebody's having to handwrite it, right? And so back in the day, you memorize stuff. And the Jewish people, they could memorize stuff easily. I don't think it should be surprising when you read the Old Testament and most of the commands are, hear, O Israel, right? It's better to hear than to sacrifice, right? It's all about hearing because they were a culture that knew how to hear, right? And we see this not only in Israel, but also in other cultures, right? Many cultures at this time period just knew how to listen, and they knew how to listen well. Um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, those were originally transmitted orally before they were written down, right? Um, the main reason I say that is because even if you were to suggest that the Bible was transmitted orally for a while, I don't think that would be an argument against the Bible um, because you have to realize it's a different culture. Nowadays, we don't memorize stuff, and oral tradition doesn't work very well for us because we've forgotten how to listen. Back then, that was how you did things, right? But whenever you look at the evidence, um, it doesn't even suggest that's what happened, right? We have evidence that they actually wrote stuff down very early. For books like Genesis, yeah, things were probably transmitted orally for a while, uh, mainly because, according to tradition, Moses is the one who wrote this stuff down. And just according to history, um, writing didn't even really become a predominant practice until shortly before the time of Moses. Uh, and so the stuff in Genesis probably had to be transmitted orally for a while, but I don't think that's any reason to not trust it. But the majority of the Old Testament books and the New Testament, we don't have any reason to think it was a really long time period before it was written down. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. In addition to that, um, the development of the Old Testament canon was organic, not council-based. That is, they were most often accepted immediately upon completion, not decided by a council of people at a later date. Um, this is really a, kind of a combination of both one and two, uh, and it's just kind of the conclusion we can arrive at based off the evidence we're about to examine. Uh, whenever you actually just look at the evidence, there is no such thing as a council of people that got together to say, here's what books made it into the Old Testament. Uh, we don't have any people claiming that that's what happened with the Old Testament, but we do have people who claim that with the New Testament. And those people are just wrong because uh, there's no historical evidence for that ever having taken place. Uh, and there's actually a lot of evidence against it. Uh, but the main thing I wanted to highlight here is that uh, it didn't seem to be as much people getting together and voting on which books made it in as it was just people receiving these books and striving to figure out what was genuinely from God, right? And to me, I think that's actually really good, right? And I think it's good sometimes that we are going to see people discussing or debating things a little bit, more with the New Testament than the Old, uh, because that debate is good because it tells us that they weren't just taking this haphazardly, right? That they were being thoughtful about this and they're wanting to make sure that the books that they're calling God-breathed are genuinely God-breathed. And so when it comes to just the evidence of how the Old Testament canon came to develop, um, those are the things we can say. One more thing, the Old Testament canon was built on the foundation of prophetic authority. 
What do I mean by that? It means the authority um, is um, prophetic authority. I believe is something that is uh, uh, it's kind of like a two-in-one word, where authority is like power and over something, and respond and like anything below the authority is responsibility for the authority, and then prophetic is like prophet. So um, yeah. So what is a prophet? Someone who foretells the future, right? Uh, that's that's one element of it. So, so oftentimes we kind of reduce prophets to so just that. The voice of God. Yeah, prophets, the person speaking with the voice of God, right? And what I'm suggesting here is that whenever you actually look at the evidence, um, the entire Old Testament canon is built on prophetic authority in the sense of people who are genuine prophets are the ones who have the right to decide what is genuinely canonical and what is not, right? And I'm going to make a case for that, right? Uh, to where technically every single person who ever speaks on behalf of God is a prophet. Uh, and I'm not just saying like, you know, a preacher is a prophet because a per like a preacher is up there speaking for the people of God, but he's not saying that his, his very words are God's words. A prophet is claiming that, right? A prophet is saying my words are God's words. And so by their very nature, every single author of scripture is a prophet. Um, but oftentimes how we'll divide it is that the Old Testament is built on prophetic authority and the New Testament is built on apostolic authority, right? So the apostles, right? Even though technically the apostles were functioning as prophets, but we'll break that all down. And so moving on, uh, let's talk about that whole question, sources of authority. And we're going to talk specifically on what it means to be a prophet. And fortunately for us, Moses, the first author of scripture who demonstrated clear evidence of having interacted with God also provides guidelines for determining whether a prophet, uh, whether a prophetic message is genuinely from God, right? But before we actually look at how Moses tells us to test future prophets, maybe we should explain that one first thing, right? How do I, what do I mean when I say Moses demonstrated clear evidence of having interacted with God? He wrote about talking to him. What's that? He wrote about talking to him. Oh, he wrote about talking about him, but the thing is I could, I could write about talking with God. How, like, what evidence would the people of Israel have that this guy actually talked with God? The Ten Commandments. They saw I could write Ten Commandments. They saw that he had been with God because his face shone when he came down from the mountain. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it, these people had very, like, visual, like, physical evidence that Moses had interacted with God. Right? If you think about the events that Moses, like, was there for... Like, these were the most public acts of God in the history of the universe, even to this day, right? Uh, we've talked about this many times with our group. Whenever Jesus showed up, that was the most important act of God to this date, but it was still relatively private, right? I mean, yeah, Jesus had a few thousand people following him at some times, which is pretty big. Um, but whenever he died on the cross, there were only a handful of people there. Whenever he resurrected, there's only like a little over 500 people who saw the resurrected Jesus, um, I mean, that's more people than go to the school that I teach at, right? Um, so if you just think about that, the, the Jesus thing is still relatively small scale. Moses, though, he was there for the Exodus, right? This is where God literally showed up and he freed a, like a nation of slaves from the most powerful nation on the world at that time period through 10 miraculous acts that were undeniably acts of God, increasingly, right? So it starts off like turning water to blood, and then like as each one goes, it becomes increasingly undeniable that this is God doing this, to the point that the final plague is literally the firstborn dying. And it's specifically the ones who do not identify themselves with the covenant of God, right? And then they exit the land through like pillars of water stacking on side by side, walking through on dry ground through the Red Sea. They go to a mountain. When they get to this mountain, a dark cloud with lightning and fire and smoke like descends upon the mountain, and the voice of God literally speaks from the mountain. And keep in mind, the people of Israel are seeing all of this, right? And going forward, when you read the Bible, they are always looking back at the Exodus as like the moment when God showed his face, right? And so Moses was the one who was like the voice of God during all of this. Right? They get to the mountain, and they say, hey, Moses, you know what? God kind of terrifies us. You go up there, you talk with God, and you come back and forth. 
right? He goes up there and he does that, and when he comes back, his face is glowing, right? So if you just think about it, like assuming that the story of the Exodus is true, Moses has clear evidence, like more than anybody else, he has clear evidence that he has walked and talked with God. And that's kind of fitting because he's the first one to write the books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all written by the guy who had the clearest evidence of talking with God. And what's really neat there is that whenever you get to that fifth book, Deuteronomy, uh, shortly before Moses dies, he actually give, gives guidelines to the people of Israel to help them determine whether or not future people are talking from God. It's almost like God had a plan here, right? It's like, okay, Moses, clearly a prophet. Now, Moses is about to die, but people, the people need to know how to figure out whether a future person is a prophet, so Moses is going to tell them. That's very helpful, right? The first thing that Moses says is this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 18. This actually isn't the first thing. This thing comes before the thing I'm going to say afterwards, but it just makes sense to present this one first. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. Now you may say in your heart, how will we know the word which Yahweh has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which Yahweh has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. Uh, the context of this passage is that Moses has literally just told the people he's about to die, and that one day in the future God is going to send them a prophet like him. Right? He said, and this is ultimately a prophecy about Jesus. Um, because he's not talking about just any prophet. He's talking about a prophet specifically like him who is undeniably connected with God, who's going to demonstrate clear act of God, who is going to deliver the people from bondage, help bring them into a new promised land, right? It is a prophet who is like Moses, bearing a new covenant. Just like Moses brought the old covenant, this guy's going to bring a new covenant, right? So there's going to be this future prophet. In the meantime, though, Moses realizes the people need help in discerning what a genuine prophet looks like. What does he tell them is the way to test that? Um, say the question again. I'm looking at the so what, what is the test that he gives them? Right? Because anybody can go forward and say, hey, I heard from God. But Moses doesn't want anybody to just believe this, right? Uh, because that's the quickest way to start a cult, right? If you believe literally anybody who comes along, well, that's dangerous, right? And one of the commandments, one of the Ten Commandments is don't take the Lord's name in vain, right? So the people of Israel take God's name very seriously. If you're going to speak in God's name, you can't just believe it. You have to test it. How does he tell them to test it? Uh, wait for it to come to pass, right? So basically the expectation is that when a prophet shows up, the way you test him is by asking him to give you a sign, right? Uh, because ultimately a prophet is somebody simply speaking on behalf of God, but anybody can do that. So what you do is you ask the prophet to give you a sign to demonstrate he is a genuine prophet, right? And what he'll do is he will give you a sign concerning the future, Right? This is why we typically associate prophets with telling the future, because this is typically what prophets will do. Right? They will say something in the future that will happen, and when that thing comes to pass, it will be a sign to the people of their time, that time period that that person was genuinely here from God. Right? Uh, because ultimately, uh, can anybody in here accurately predict the future? No. Right? And, and whenever we say a sign here, we're not just talking about, like, it's going to rain tomorrow. It's going to be more specific than that, right? It's going to be something hyper-specific that is undeniably from God, like right? Like Jesus gave, like, the sign of Jonah. Exactly, right? And that's what I was just going to highlight. Um, so the people of Israel did this with Jesus, right? Uh, they show up and they say, what sign will you give us to prove that you are who you claim to be? The issue is that they're asking this well after Jesus has already demonstrated right. that he's a prophet. <laughs> like, Jesus has already given them a million different signs, and so that's why he responds to them and says, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. The only sign that you're going to get is the sign of Jonah, right? Just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so too the Son of Man will be three days in the belly of the earth, right? And so basically the way that Jesus says this, he says, you want to know that I'm a prophet? You want to know that I am who I claim to be? Kill me and wait three days. That's why the resurrection of Jesus is so central to our belief, because it's his proof that he is who he claims to be. Not only a prophet, but God in the flesh, mm -hmm. right? And he does that at another time, too. 
uh, whenever Jesus is flipping t- uh, tables in the temple. They come up to him, and they say, yo, 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 <laughs> who are you? Like, basically, he's saying, zeal from, like, this is my father's house. And they're saying, who are you to claim that this is your father's house? Right? This is our father's house, but he's using it like he has a special relationship with God. Like, he is the son of God. And they say, what sign will you give us to prove that you are who you claim to be? And he says, tear this temple down, and in three days I'll rebuild it. So, same sign. He says, kill me, wait three days, right? And so Jesus, we see this happening there. But we also see this in other places in the Bible, right? So um, there's this guy named Elijah, right? And he is somebody who, uh, he never writes a book of the Bible, as far as we're aware. There's at least no book named after him, but he does show up in like Kings and stuff like that. Um, But he does predict the future and stuff, right? He will say, there will not like, there will be a drought in the land for this many days, right? And then it'll all of a sudden stop raining for a certain amount of days. And then he will pray and the rain will return, right? And so the prophet will give a sign to validate his ministry, right? And that's ultimately what this is. This is what we can call the prophetic test, right? If the person shows up and they're saying, I'm speaking in the name of God, okay, well, when that guy gives you a sign, wait and see if the sign comes to pass, If the sign doesn't come to pass, the guy's a liar, and we know that God's not a liar, right? And so, therefore, that guy's a false prophet, uh, and it says you shouldn't be afraid of him. And in the land of Israel, do you know what could happen if you were a false prophet? Oh, Yeah, you could be killed, right? So this is something they took very seriously. Then, in addition to this, Deuteronomy chapter 13, a few chapters earlier, Moses says this. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us walk after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your God is testing you to find out if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So what is the second test that he gives there? Um, it's the it's the belief to see if um, you're really willing to follow God and not go after other gods. Okay. It's yeah. The, it's the positive of the one before. Yeah. So these two go hand in hand. That's what I'm trying to argue there, right? Um, because basically, what he's saying here is that all because something comes to pass doesn't mean that you've heard from God. Because if this person shows up and he's telling you to follow another god, and he gives you a sign. And that sign comes to pass. Does that mean that you're just going to abandon Yahweh and follow this other God? And he says, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. I missed it. Yeah. Because he's saying, maybe God has allowed that sign to come to pass because he's testing you. And he wants to see whether or not you're going to blindly follow this person. Whereas during the time period of Moses, God has already made it clear. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Right? The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Mm-hmm. Right? So he's made it clear. There's one God, serve him only. And so if this prophet comes around and he gives you a sign and that sign comes to pass and then he says, okay, since that sign came to pass, let's go worship Baal. Let's go worship Ares. Let's go worship Poseidon. You reject him. You say, no, no, no. We worship God. And so what you can say here, if you're actually even making it a little bit broader, is that what the prophet says has to line up with what has been previously revealed. Right? It had already been previously revealed to the people of Israel, they only have one God. And therefore, since God is a God of truth, later revelation is not going to contradict prior revelation. And so if God said, worship me only, and another dude shows up and says, hey, I'm a genuine prophet. Let's go worship another God. You don't listen to him because he is contradicting prior revelation where God said, worship me alone. And you can see that both of those components are here as well. Right? So in the first one, it says, when a prophet speaks in the name of Yahweh. Right? So that test right there is specifically in the context of somebody speaking on behalf of the one true God. Right? So if he's claiming to be from God, well, then you test him by seeing what sign he gives. Right? But regardless of whether or not he gives you a sign, if he calls you to worship another God, or if he tells you to do something that contradicts prior revelation, you don't listen to him. And I think if you take these two things you all of a sudden have a way of kind of figuring out whether or not God has truly spoken, right? Because ultimately that's the challenge for us when it comes to figuring out the canon. Because it's not simply a matter of us picking what books we like. 
if we genuinely believe that God is inspiring these books, we're trying to figure out how do we know that the God of the universe is speaking through man. Mm -hmm. And what I like here is that Moses is careful to outline that. Uh, I just think that's really good because um, if, if you're starting a cult, you don't do this, right? If you're starting a false belief system or if you're teaching a lie, you don't give such high standards for this stuff, right? Because he's saying, don't just believe anybody. These people need to have the credentials to back it up, which is good because that means that they're relying on truth here, right? Because that means that Moses is confident that God is genuinely speaking through him and God will genuinely speak through other people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? It's, it's just very encouraging and very useful because you're like, okay, good. Um, he's not just telling us to blindly receive this, whereas that's what a lot of cult leaders will do, right? Oh, I heard from God. And as long as I can you know, say this in a very charismatic and um, convincing way, I'll just cause you to believe it. Um, I talked about uh, Latter-day Saints a little bit last week, um, but this is what they'll do a lot of times when it comes to the Book of Mormon. Uh, and once again, I'm not saying this to attack Latter-day Saints because I've got a lot of friends who are Mormons and, and I love them. But the issue is, whenever they tell you to read the Book of Mormon, they say, ultimately, don't test it. You just pray about it and God will convince you. Like, like you'll, you'll feel this feeling that will convict you of its truth. And that's why you should believe it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says to test the spirits. And it says to not just blindly believe. It says you need to examine it and test to see if it's true. And so if the Book of Mormon was consistent with what the Old and New Testament taught, then I'd be more convinced. But it's not. And that's why I can't go there. Right? And because I don't think that the Old and New Testament sets up the grounds for that at all. Right? So I think that it actually contradicts that. And that's why I can't join that crowd. Yeah. Right? A lot of times people... Like, the reason they won't join it is because they think that they have weird beliefs and stuff like that. I don't like making fun of people's beliefs because I think Christian beliefs can be very weird if you think of them from, like, a natural perspective, like a naturalistic perspective, right? I don't like making fun of people's beliefs, right? The reason why I can't follow into the Latter-day Saint category is because I think that what they are doing contradicts what the scriptures have established, right? And that's what Moses is establishing right here. So if you're going to summarize it, you would have two principles of canonicity. The first one is the prophetic test, right? What the prophet has said must come to pass. Prophets must be held to the highest standard. Everything they say must come to pass. If the prophet prophesies something that and that thing does not come to pass, even if he claims to speak in the name of Yahweh, he is to be deemed a false prophet. Um, and there might be some instances where um, a prophet might make like a contingency, right? Where he'll say, hey... This is going to happen unless you repent. Well, obviously, then there's a reason why it doesn't happen if the people repent, right? But if he makes a matter-of-fact statement and that statement does not come to pass, then that person is a false prophet, right? So the prophetic test is super important. What the prophet has said must come to pass. The prophet must be held to the highest and utmost standard, right? This is not to be taken lightly. And then secondly, guiding principle number two, the consistency test. The prophet must guide people to worship the one true God. It cannot contradict prior revelation. Even if the so-called prophet can perform miraculous signs, if his message leads people away from the truth of what has already been revealed, he is not to be believed. If future prophecy disagrees with older prophecy, it's wrong. Uh, and the main reason I highlight this is not because we have explicit evidence of people discussing this very thing in regards to the Old Testament. Uh, the reason I mention this is because this is the standard that the Old Testament sets for itself, right? And so regardless of the evidence that we have, um, we know that this is what, biblically speaking, is the rule for canon, right? And so whether or not this is what the Jewish people did at that time period, we, we just don't know. But this is what Moses demands, and this is what God demands through Moses, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why it's important for us to look at this. Because from a human perspective, we don't know what they actually did. We're going to look at what it seems like they did, and we're going to try to piece that together. But this is God's perspective of canon, right? What the prophet has said must come to pass, and what he says must line up with what is priorly, has been revealed prior. And therefore, it must be consistent with who God is and what he has demanded before. Make sense? Yes. The okay. Second, the cool. second one's kind of like um, in Exodus, like with the serpent and the staff. 
turned their staffs into yes. serpents, but so did Moses. He did also. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that, that's one thing here where we see that there's an acknowledgement that there are other forces out in the world that might be able to accomplish supernatural feats, right? So all because somebody performs a miracle does not mean you should blindly follow them, right? Because we have good reason to believe the things that the Bible teaches, and therefore we need to stick with what the Bible says. And so if somebody shows up, even nowadays, if somebody were to walk in here and perform this crazy miracle and just start levitating in the air. We should not blindly follow them because the biblical worldview is a worldview where there are other supernatural entities and divine beings that can lead people astray and cause people to do things. And it even suggests that sometimes God himself might be empowering this person to do this in order to test you, right? So he might be allowing this person to temporarily do something very deceptive and convincing ultimately because he wants to test your heart to see whether or not you will stick true to his word, right? So the idea is that God himself values his word so highly that he wants you to test everything by it, right? That's very important for us, right? And that's helpful for us as we move forward through our study of the canon. And so let's talk about the principles in practice. Um, these guidelines of determining whether or not someone is truly speaking on behalf of God has two important implications uh, that we can say in regard to the development of the canon. Firstly, it shows Israel did not haphazardly accept anything as the word of God. Um, Yahweh takes his word seriously, and so he gave them guidelines to determine whether something was genuinely from him. Like we mentioned already, the punishment for false prophecy was death. Israel didn't just select random books for their spiritual canon. There were strict guidelines that needed to be met. Uh, the main reason I put this one here is because I don't want you to think that the reason we have the Old Testament canon is because um, the people of Israel were like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I like that one. That's not what happened, right? From the very first author of Scripture, we see that prophets are given this almost impossible standard to meet, and they're going to be held to that, right? And therefore, like, and you have to realize also, the Jewish people built their entire lives around the law. Right? Some of this stuff, like the prophetic test, consistency test thing, that might be stuff that's new to you. This would be stuff that they have memorized. Right? They know these are the standards God demands. And therefore, whenever a prophet shows up, this is what they will hold it to. Right? I'm not saying every person in Israel would do that because the people of Israel, they went astray. Right? A lot of times they were in rebellion against God. They probably did not know the law. But the people who were faithful, this is the stuff that they would have been holding prophets to. Right? And therefore... These people, the ones who were the faithful people, genuinely trying to discern what was from God, these are the standards they're holding it to, and therefore they're not going to haphazardly accept anything. Right? Secondly, confirmed scriptures held greater authority than those which came after. Uh, and whenever I say greater authority, I am not saying that the book of Genesis has greater authority than Malachi. I'm saying that when it comes to human understanding and recognition of the canon, uh, Malachi has to be tested by Genesis. Does that make sense? Right? So, like, ultimately, they all have the same authority because they're all from God. But if they already know for a fact that Genesis is from God, and they're still trying to figure out whether or not Malachi is, well, in that moment, from their perspective, Genesis has the higher authority because Malachi can't be, um, it, it can't be inconsistent with Genesis. The prophetic test, as stipulated in Scripture, establishes a key precedent. No person has authority over the text of Scripture. Rather, that which has been confirmed as God's word has authority over everything else. Right? So this is useful for us going forward because that means that Exodus can't contradict Genesis. Leviticus can't contradict Exodus and Genesis. Right? All the things that the prophets say must line up with what the Torah says. Right? Because the things which chronologically came later must be consistent with what came before, and therefore you can't just haphazardly accept everything that comes your way. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. So now what I want to do, um, and this is ultimately just how we're going to structure the rest of the night here, we're going to talk about internal evidence and external evidence when it comes to the development of the Old Testament canon. Did you still make that slide up? Okay. Um, so we're going to look at internal evidence first. Uh, and my question to you is, what do you think I mean when it comes to internal evidence? Where are we going to be looking at? 
Bible? Inside the Bible, specifically where? Inside the, I guess the Torah. Old Testament, right? We're going to specifically look inside the Old Testament. And when it comes to determining how the canon came to be, what type of information do you think we're going to be looking at? Probably, we're looking for. Um, when it comes to, like, the information on apologetics, right? Yes. Yeah, but, but what information do you think we're going to be looking for? Like, what details would we be looking for that would be helpful for us when it comes to determining whether, like, how the canon came to be? Probably, from an internal perspective. Probably that things that explain that that was God's plan all along. Okay. Like maybe, uh, I know how to word this, it's just kind of limiting me, but basically it's um, how God, uh, I think I was right the first time I said it, but okay. when I said that he was, that was always his plan and that nothing was done by accident. Okay. Anybody else got some ideas? Time stamps that give like specific like this many weeks or fast forward this amount of time. Okay, now you're heading in the right direction, right? So the two main things that I find really useful when it comes to this is looking for details of when things were written down and whether or not they were treated with authority, mm -hmm. right? Those are the two things that are probably most useful for us when it comes to looking at the internal evidence of the Old Testament because it will let us know how quickly these things were written down and how quickly they were treated with authority. Right? Uh, it'd be one thing if it's like, ooh, um, <laughs> Moses received this stuff, and then hundreds of years later, some dude showed up and wrote it down. Yeah. Okay, well, that could allow for some shaky, air, like, that could be shaky ground for some people. Once again, it doesn't mean that it's inherently wrong. It just could be a stumbling block to some. Right. And then, if it wasn't treated with authority at all immediately, and then it's not until, like, hundreds of years later that it's treated with authority, then you got to ask what changed. And so whenever we're looking at the internal evidence, we're looking for verses that would suggest to us that things were written down early and treated authoritative early, right? That's what we're looking for. And the cool thing is that we have a lot of evidence for that, right? And so we start off, uh, oh, the text of the Old Testament itself demonstrates that it developed organically. Uh, and I already kind of defined what I meant by organically before. Uh, basically, it was written down early and it was treated as authoritative almost immediately. Right? If you look at the internal evidence of the Old Testament, you actually see that's exactly how it's presented. We start in the book of Exodus. Why do you think we would start in Exodus and not Genesis? Maybe because Genesis showcases creation and just the overall like origin, like starting, I think, like the origin of the Jews starting from Abraham. Okay. Um, ultimately, who do we believe to be the traditional author of the Torah? Moses, Moses right? Which book of the Torah does Moses not show up in? Genesis. 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 And so we wouldn't expect to see any internal evidence of the development of the canon there because you don't have anybody writing anything down or there's nothing to be treated as authoritative because Moses isn't even around, right? And so you wouldn't expect any information there. You would expect to start finding information in Exodus, and that's exactly what you find. Exodus chapter 17. Um, this is right after the people of Israel have been freed from bondage. Right? Chapters 14 and 15 is whenever they're going through the Red Sea. Chapters 16, 17, 18, 19, that is their journey to Mount Sinai. Chapter 17, uh, this is what God says to Moses. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it in Joshua's hearing that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So the Amalekites, these were basically as soon as the people of Israel got out um, from the Red Sea and stuff, and started going into the wilderness. The Amalekites were the first people to oppose them. And God did not like that. And so basically, very early on, God says, you know what, here's the deal. The people of Israel, y'all are going to wipe out the Amalekites one day. Uh, this is why it's such a big issue later on. We talked about this on Tuesday night. Uh, whenever King Saul didn't do it, right? Because he was directly disobeying a commandment that God established in Exodus chapter 17. Mm -hmm. But the information that's useful for us is that God tells Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it in Joshua's hearing. Um, first off, if you're writing stuff in a book, what does that probably suggest? It's important. It's important. It's important because you got to remember back in the day, it's not like – like nowadays we have like post-it notes and we've got like just you know, notes apps where we can just type anything. Back in the day, it was a lot harder to write stuff down, right? First off, most people were illiterate and so it's not like everybody would be able to read this. 
right? And most people didn't know how to write either. Uh, and so if somebody was writing something down, it was probably something that was super duper important. And it's not like they just had like papyrus laying around everywhere, right? Especially in the Old Testament, most likely, usually whenever they're writing stuff down, it's either being etched into a stone or it's being like written onto like leather or animal skins or something like that, right? And so this is not like an easy process to do. So the mere fact that God commands Moses to write it down suggests that what he's about to say is super duper important. But in addition to that, what else does he communicate there? Write this in a book as a memorial. memorial. What does that tell us? To remember what God did. Yeah. The reason why it's important is because future generations need to remember this. But then it has to be recited in whose hearing? Joshua. Joshua. Who is Joshua? The guy that was, uh, came after Moses as the leader. Yeah. It's, it's literally going to be the, the leader after Moses. Right? So God tells the current leader of Israel to write something down so it can be repeated in the next leader's hearing. Which means that whatever he's saying carries authority. Right? And so he's saying, Moses, write this down now. Write it down so it can be recited to the future leader because it's going to affect how he leads. Right? So it's written down with authority. We move on. Exodus chapter 24. Um, this is now where Moses has gone up the mountain to receive some of the Ten Commandments. Well, not the Ten Commandments. He's receiving the law. Right? The Ten Commandments are in Exodus chapter 20. God speaks to the people. Uh, and the people say, Moses, we would rather you go up the mountain for us. And so that's what Moses does. And then we read this. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. All right, what's significant there for us? Um, recounting to the people all the words of Yahweh probably suggests that um, that I want to say the translation was successful, but let me see. Um, so if you're reading the story. Moses literally just heard this from God, right. right? And so he literally hears it. He comes over and he says it to the people. And then how do they respond? They, they say recount it the way now. They say they're going to obey, which oh, tells us yeah. that they treated these words with authority. Authority, right? They treated them with authority. And then what does God tell Moses to do? Or well, or what does Moses do? Write down all the He words. immediately writes it down, right? And so and if you think about it, like, I heavily doubt that anybody reading through Exodus 24 regularly just, like, really just focuses on those words. And Moses wrote down the words. Because if you think about it, that's not information that really adds much to the text itself, right? You could easily get rid of that sentence, and you already see the words of God have been communicated, the people have responded obediently. But by the inspiration of God, Moses even wrote down, and Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh which is really useful for us as people who are studying the canon because we can see, oh wow, he apparently wrote this down immediately, right? That's really cool. He received it from God, he communicated it to the people, they treated it with authority, and then he wrote it down right then and there, right? If he didn't put that sentence, we wouldn't know when it was written down, right? For all we know, what he communicated to them then was different than what we have in our Bibles. But instead it says, no, he wrote it down right then and there. That's useful. We move on. Exodus chapter 34. Um, this is where the people of Israel, um, like basically Moses goes back up the mountain. The people of Israel get scared and nervous and they start worshiping a golden calf. God is not happy. Moses understands that he's not happy, but Moses manages to talk God down. And he says, God, forgive these people, please. And God agrees to renew the covenant he's made with them. And that's what he says. Write down these words. For in accordance with these words, I have cut a covenant with you and with Israel. Okay, why is that significant? Because he's a faithful God and he wants to have a relationship with his people. Yes, but specifically in regards to the canon, how is it significant? Because he wrote it down. He wrote the information down, God told him. Yes, apparently God viewed this covenant with Israel as being very important and it needed to be written down. Uh, specifically, uh, it's almost like um, 
whenever you make an agreement with somebody and they don't hold their end of the agreement, and so next time they make a promise, you say, hey, could I have that in writing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's kind of what God's doing here. Like, so right? you refer back to it. Yes, yeah. because he'd already made this covenant with them, and then they immediately broke it whenever Moses went up the mountain. Mm -hmm. So this time, God says, Moses, write this down. Right? I want this written down so that it will always exist as a testimony to the covenant we've made. Yeah. Which, on one hand, holds the people of Israel accountable, but it's also God holding himself accountable saying, even though y'all messed up, I'm not backing down. Yeah. Right? That's really cool. Right? And so, just by the very nature of what he's commanding, there's authority to this, and we see that it's being written down very early on. Numbers chapter 33, we skip Leviticus uh, because Leviticus just doesn't really have a lot of evidence about like things being written down because Leviticus, by its very nature, is more just laws. Mm -hmm. But when you get to Numbers, uh, this is actually kind of fun because we see that Moses writes down even things that we would think are insignificant. It says this, These are the journeys of the sons of Israel, by which they came out of the land of Egypt by their armies, by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote down their starting places, according to their journeys, by the command of Yahweh. And these are the journeys according to their starting places. That's cool, right? I heavily doubt that anybody reading through Numbers would just stop and reflect on verses 1 and 2 and be like, wow, let me just, let me just study those verses for a while. But if you view this from a canonical perspective, it's actually really neat. Because this means that basically Moses was taking journal entries along the way. Because as they were journeying, he realized that even the places they were going to were significant and should be written down. And it says that he didn't just write it down because he wanted to, but it says according to the command of Yahweh, he did this. Right? Literally, they're going through the wilderness and God tells him, hey, Moses, I want you to write down not simply the commands I'm giving you. I want you to write down the places y'all stop at. Right? And I don't know why God commanded this. Maybe it was just to remind us that this is historical realities, right? It'd be one thing if the only things that were written down in the Bible were just random commands that put Moses in a lot of power or something like that. But instead, that's not what we see. We see that these are commands that teach you to love people and deny yourself. And then, in addition to the commands, it also just records historical realities that might not even be relevant to you or me, but they're written down to prove to us that they're historical realities. Right? We usually glaze over this stuff because it bores us. But that's because we're very me-centric and we just want to read the Bible and figure out what it says about me. But if you actually slow down, you'll realize that verses like Numbers chapter 33, verses 1 and 2, they teach us this stuff actually happened. And apparently, the events that happened were so significant that God himself commanded the leader at that time period to write down even the places they started and stopped. That's pretty neat. We move on. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Um, this is uh, right before Moses talks about the whole prophet like me thing. Uh, and what he has basically told the people is that he's about to die. They're going to go into the promised land. And whenever they get into the promised land, ultimately they're not supposed to have a king because God's supposed to be their king. But inevitably, they're going to put a king in place. Right? They're just going to do it. And Moses knows this. God knows it. And God's actually going to allow for it. Right? Many of the commands God makes in the Torah are actually allowing for man's hardness of heart. And so what Moses tells them is this. Now it will be when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this Torah, right, law. He shall write for himself a copy of this Torah on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahweh's God, to carefully observe all the words of this law and these statutes. This is really significant when it comes to the whole canon thing. What does this tell us? What are some details that you find interesting or useful there? That it says, he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear God. Yes. That's a big aspect of it. But he has to have his own copy, because I mean, having your own copy of, of scripture was not a common thing back then, because it was expensive, and it took a lot of work and a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. So you have like, first off, um, he's telling the people, hey, inevitably, whenever you choose to rebel against the words of God and you appoint a king over you, that guy, at least he needs to follow the word of God. 
and it's so important that he follow the word of God, he needs to make a copy himself. That's interesting, right? Whenever he talks about leadership, right, in the land of Israel, the first order of business that this king is told to do is make a copy of the word of God. Which means that even Moses, as he's writing the book, right, make a copy of this law, like the book that he's currently writing, he says, this book is to be treated with such authority that whenever you place a king over all of you, his first order of business is to make a copy of it. Which is cool because who is typically the person who makes the laws in a nation? In a monarchy? The king. The king. Mm -hmm. But apparently kings in Israel are not going to function like kings elsewhere. Because apparently this king has to follow the same laws as everybody else. And he can't change it. Right? So if you just like understand the implications of what Moses is saying here, he's saying that this law does not just apply for the people wandering in the wilderness. He is saying when you get in the land... Generations from now, whenever you turn from God and you decide to appoint a king, even then, this law will still apply to you. And it doesn't just apply to you, it applies to your king. And it applies to your king to such a degree that the first thing he needs to do whenever he's made king is he needs to hand copy it himself. And not only does he need to hand copy it himself, he needs to do it in the presence of the, Levit in the, presence of the Levitical priests. Why would they need to be there? So he can't add or take anything from it. So he can't add or take anything from it. Right? They need to be watching him do this so that he cannot change the law because these are the words of God. And it shall be with him. Right? The reason why he has to hand copy this is because, you know what? The priests need a copy, but the king always needs to have access to it. Right? If he ever needs to figure out what to do, he needs to have this Torah with him at all times. So it needs to be like always with him. Right? It's like the, it's like the king's crown. Right? It's one of his essential accessories. And he shall read it all the days of his life. What does all mean? All. All. Right? He shall read it all the days of his life. Right? I don't care if he's tired. I don't care if he feels like he hasn't gotten any sleep. He needs to read it. That he may learn to fear Yahweh his God. The word of God, the Torah, is being treated as the way by which the people learn to relate properly to God. To carefully observe all the words of the law and these statutes. So the king himself is to follow the law even if the people of Israel are not. That's high authority, right? And it's being he's basically saying, write this down quickly, right? That's really cool. Like Moses is in the process of writing the book right then, and he is already making preparations for people to make copies of it yeah. because apparently it's that important. Deuteronomy chapter 27. Then Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep the entire commandment which I am commanding you today. So it will be on the day when you cross the Jordan to the land of which Yahweh will, your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones and coat them with lime and write on them all the words of this Torah when you cross over, so that you may enter the land which Yahweh your God gives you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the God of your fathers promised you. Why is this? Like, what's he saying here? Why is this significant for understanding the importance of the same thing? as the last one? Very similar. It is very similar. To keep the entire commandment, um, so that kind of proves that it's significant in throughout history. Mm -hmm. So he's telling them, guys, y'all are about to enter into the promised land. Your, parent, your, your fathers have waited for this for hundreds of years. And he says, first thing you do when you cross the Jordan River, right? As soon as you enter the land, first thing I want you to do is I want you to get some stones. Not, not just parchments, not just scrolls. I want you to get stones. And the first thing you do when you get in the land is I want you to make a copy of this Torah on the stones. Well, that shows what the priority is, right? As soon as they enter the land, the first thing they do is they establish this kingdom will be built on the word of God. I don't know of a way that you could treat the word of God with more authority, right? Imagine if I just gave you an assignment right now and told you to go hand copy Genesis on a piece of paper. That, you probably wouldn't want to do it. You'd probably groan about doing it. But at the very least, you'd understand that I took the word of God seriously. Now imagine that I told you, all right, whenever you buy your first house, what I want you to do is I want you to go find some big old stones. And I want you to etch Genesis through Deuteronomy into them. That's a big command, right? This is not an overnight project. Right? This is years and years of dedicated work, but God says that's what you do when you get in the land. You need to write it down immediately because it is to be treated with the highest level of authority. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 28. 
Uh, this is where God has been outlining the um, blessings and curses that will come upon them, whether or not, like, depending on whether or not they're obedient to God. If you are not careful to do all the words of this Torah, which are written in this book, to fear this glorious and fearsome name, Yahweh your God, then Yahweh will bring wondrous plagues on you. Right? So how they respond to the Torah will affect how they live in the world. That's a pretty big deal. Deuteronomy chapter 31. So Moses wrote this Torah and gave it to the priests. Okay, so we see him writing it down immediately. The sons of Levi who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, you shall read this Torah in front of all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men and the women and little ones and the sojourner who is within your gates so that they may hear and so that they may learn and fear Yahweh your God and be careful to do all the words of this Torah. What is he telling them to do? Law, do this. Um, what's in this? What's written in this Torah? And beyond that, what's he telling them to do? Be Yahweh. Beyond that, like what? What's the main thing he's telling them to do here? Be careful to do all the words. No, no, no. What's the main thing he's telling them to do? Read it. Yes. When? In front of all Israel. In front of all Israel. When though? Every seven years. Every seven years, in front of all the people of Israel, men, women, children, sojourners, right? Uh, why would they need to do this? To intentionally give them a constant reminder. To have a constant reminder, because once again, most people couldn't read. It's not like they all had personal copies of their Bible they could study. Whenever you actually look at the Torah and read the laws, like there were different feasts that people had to attend every year, right? But even then, it was just the men who had to attend. Right? For this, every seven years, it says every seven years, get the men, get the women, get the children, heck, get the sojourners, get the people who are just passing through, whoever is dwelling in the land. Every seven years, get them together and recite these words to them because it is of the utmost importance that they obey. And Moses says this to them as he writes it down, right? He writes the Torah, he gives it to the priest, and he says, read this every seven years. It's being written down quickly, been treated with authority immediately. Deuteronomy chapter 31. So now, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the sons of Israel. Put it in their mouths so that this song may be a witness for me against the sons of Israel. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the sons of Israel. Basically, um, this is setting up a song that Moses is going to sing in Deuteronomy 32 that basically predicts that the people of Israel are going to go astray. Right? This is Moses giving a sign to the people of Israel. Right? They're going to read this song, and the song says they're going to go astray, and it says exactly how it's going to go down. So that when it happens, it will confirm that God was telling the truth. Right? So Moses is being told, write this song down immediately, and it's going to be treated with authority. And they're going to read this so that when they do fall astray, the words of the song will be a testimony against them. And it happened when Moses finished writing the words of this Torah in a book until they were complete. Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant to Yahweh, take this book of the Torah and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Where does he tell them to put it? Beside the Ark of the Covenant. Beside the Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? The place where God dwelt. The place where God dwelt. So you have God dwelling here, and Moses finishes this, and he says, I want you to put this book right next to where God dwells, which means that he's treating it with what? Authority. Authority. Right? The utmost authority, right? He's not saying, I just put this on some shelf in the back of your house. He's saying, no. This Torah goes right next to the presence of God. Uh, Joshua chapter 1. This book of the Torah, right? So now you're moving on from Moses. You're going into Joshua. This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way successful, and then you will be prosperous. Right, so this Joshua chapter one takes place the same year that Deuteronomy ends. Right, Moses completes the Torah. Joshua, at the beginning of chapter one, is told, "Take this Torah, reflect on it, meditate on it, make it your every single breath, because if you obey it, it will change how you live, and it will affect how you prosper in life." Specifically, Joshua is being charged to go conquer the land. Obeying the Torah is the key to conquering the land. 
right? So it is written down immediately so that Moses, so Joshua can study it, and it's being treated with authority. It's been it's being treated with such authority that the success of Joshua's mission lies in his obedience to it. Joshua chapter eight. Then Joshua built an altar to Yahweh, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of Yahweh, had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of Torah of Moses. And he wrote there on the stones a copy of the Torah of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. The main thing I'm highlighting there is that there was already a Torah of Moses to be studied, and he is already making a copy of it. Right? So we have Joshua making a copy, and so now we have two copies of the Torah very early on. Joshua chapter 24. So Joshua cut a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and a judgment in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the Torah of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Yahweh. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of Yahweh which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you, lest you deny your God. The main thing I'm highlighting there, I'm going to try to go through these a little bit quicker because I want to get to external evidence. Um, the main thing I'm highlighting here is that it is being etched into stone once again, right? This is the Torah, but then we also have Joshua recording his own words as well, right? And so Joshua, who has already received confirmation as a prophet from Moses, now Joshua himself is writing stuff as well, and those words are being treated with authority as well. Make sense? All right. First uh, Samuel chapter 10. Right, jumping forward a little bit, we're, I, I really wanted to spend time with Moses to just show how the Torah was written down um, and treated with authority early on. But now we're going to go a little bit faster through the rest of the books. First Samuel chapter 10, Samuel spoke with the people about the legal judgments of the kingdom and wrote them in a book and placed it before Yahweh. Right, So Samuel is writing things down immediately and he's placing them before Yahweh. Whenever it says placing them before Yahweh, what does that probably mean? Like, By the Ark of the Covenant, yeah. which is where what is also placed? The Torah, right? So the Torah is already by the Ark of the Covenant. And now Samuel is putting his words there as well, which means that Samuel is treating his words with authority. authority. And not only authority, but equal authority with the Torah. words of the Torah, right? So Samuel's words are immediately being treated on par with the Torah. First Kings chapter 2. Uh, then David's time drew near. So he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. So you shall be strong and be a man, and you shall keep the responsibility given by Yahweh your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies according to what is written in the Torah of Moses, that you may be prosperous. So Mo David, generations later, is still treating the Torah as authoritative even to his fellow king, his son Solomon. Right? Very important. Second Kings chapter 22. Um, at this time period, the Torah has actually gone missing from the people of Israel. Uh, and somebody happens to be going through the temple, and they find a copy of a scroll. And they come to the king, and they say, hey, we found this scroll in the temple. Is it important? And this is what happens. Now, it happened that when the king heard the words of the book of the Torah, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded, go inquire of Yahweh for me and the people in all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of Yahweh, which is set aflame against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. The king reads the words of the Torah, and he has immediate confirmation that these are words from a prophet, because the things that the Torah says are going to happen whenever the people disobey God are happening in his time period. And he says, no wonder this stuff's happening. We haven't been studying the Torah and so he tears his clothes and he grieves because he realizes that God has spoken and they haven't been studying his word. That's a problem. That also like explains how, you know, people like kind of make a big deal out of, you know, they're like, some people today just don't really want to read the Bible that much. Yeah. That kind of answers that too. Yep. Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, from the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, discerned in the books the number of the years concerning which the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet for the fulfillment of the laying waste of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. This is cool. Daniel is in the land of Babylon, right? Babylon is a long way away from the land of Israel where Jeremiah wrote his book 70 years earlier. 
right? So just 70 years after Jeremiah wrote his book in Jerusalem, Daniel is way over in Babylon, and apparently Jeremiah's book has been copied so many times that Daniel has a copy of it with him over in Babylon. And not only does he have a copy of it, but he is studying it as authoritative to such a degree that he is able to discern certain things about the future based off of what Jeremiah wrote in his book. That means that this stuff was written down very early. It was copied and treated as authoritative very early to such a degree that Daniel, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, could be studying this within a few decades and be treating it with authoritative and have his own personal copy. That's really cool, right? Uh, this isn't like generations later. This is like, yeah, 70 years, right? Daniel's already saying like, yeah, Jeremiah the prophet. Everybody knows he's a legitimate prophet. I, like everybody's been studying his stuff. I was studying his stuff and I was able to discern things about the future from studying his stuff. That's cool. Uh, I put both of these up. Okay, Daniel chapter 9. Indeed, all Israel has trespassed against your Torah, even turning aside, not listening to your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the Torah of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Right? So he was saying how he was treating Jeremiah's word as authoritative, but at the same time, he's still holding the Torah as the standard. Right? So all these things are together, right? He's treating these things as canonical. Right? It's not like there was just it's not like the Torah was forgotten here. No, he's holding them together. In addition to this, other prophets are also acknowledged as prophets in the text of other biblical books. Isaiah is mentioned in 2 Kings second, and, uh, and 2 Chronicles. Jeremiah is mentioned in Ezra, uh, 2 Chronicles, and Daniel. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings. And further, this is actually really cool. Daniel is mentioned by the prophet Ezekiel, despite the fact that the two were contemporaries, both alive during the Babylonian exile. So, in the book of Ezekiel, he mentions Daniel the prophet. And Daniel is living at that time period. Yet Ezekiel acknowledges him as a legitimate prophet from God and even esteems him to compare him to people like Job and Noah and says that Daniel is that righteous. That is really cool because that means that despite the fact that they were living at the same time period, people recognize that Daniel was somebody who was actively speaking authoritatively from God. That's cool. And so I say all that because if you look at the internal evidence, you have really good evidence just from the text of Scripture that it was written down very early on and treated as authoritative immediately, right? We don't have evidence from all the books, but we don't need evidence from all the books, right? We simply need to see how the people of Israel were treating this from an internal perspective. Now what I want to do is I want to look at the external evidence, and this is where I think it actually gets really exciting. Uh, whenever I was teaching this to my students at the school, they actually really enjoyed this stuff. Uh, and so I, I feel bad we're going to have to kind of go through it a little bit quicker to get us done on time, right. um, but it's really exciting. Uh, so sometime after the time of Malachi, right, that's whenever the Old Testament kind of came to an end, its end, approximately 400 B.C., and before the time of Christ, in the first century A.D., the Old Testament canon was identified as complete, right? This is basically universally agreed, right? So sometime uh, in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, the Old Testament canon came to look like what we have it as nowadays, right? The question is, when? Right? From an ontological perspective, we would say as soon as Malachi lifted his pen, boom, the Old Testament canon is done. But we're specifically trying to figure out when did it begin to function that way and when did the Jewish people officially recognize it as completed? Right? When did the people recognize that the prophetic voice had kind of died down? And we can narrow it down just right off the bat to some time in between there. But let's look at the external evidence. We start with the book of Sirach. Uh, Sirach is one of the books of the Apocrypha, uh, also known as the Deuter Deuterocanonical books from a Catholic perspective. Um, we're Protestants, and so we have 66 books in our Bible. Um, but if you were to go to a Catholic, if you were to go to a Catholic Bible, they would actually have a few extra books, right? Um, there's actually several different apocryphal books. Um, this book I have right here has a bunch of them in there. Uh, but Sirach is one of them, right? Uh, I would not. I, I don't believe that Sirach belongs in the canon, and I think there's different reasons why. We'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit. Um, but uh, in the book of Sirach, which was written about 180 B.C., about halfway in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, this is what this guy says. Many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that followed them. And for these, we should praise Israel for instruction and wisdom. 
So my grandfather Jesus, this is not talking about the Jesus from the Bible, different Jesus. So my grandfather Jesus, who had devoted himself especially to the reading of the law and the prophets and the other books of our ancestors and had acquired considerable proficiency in them, and then he goes to talk about some other stuff. Uh, there's a reason this is useful, but it might not at first be evident to y'all just from first glance. So this guy's writing about 180 BC, and he talks about his grandfather studying the law and the prophets and the other books. Do y'all know why this is significant? Because they tie together in some way. They do tie together in some way. Do you know what Jewish people call the Old Testament? No, they call it the... It's not the Torah. Torah's part of it. Yeah, what do they call the Old Testament? In Hebrew. Well, in Hebrew, like, in English they call it the Hebrew Bible. What do they call it in Hebrew? I know. Yes, they call it the Tanakh. Right? This right here, this book is the Tanakh. Right? But Tanakh is actually an acronym. Right? In Hebrew they don't actually have vowels. Right? So it's actually three letters. T-N-K. Tanakh. Right? The T stands for Torah. The N stands for, for Nevaim. And the K stands for Ketuvim. Right? T, Torah. What does that translate to? Law. Law right? Law. In Nevaim, that means prophets. And then the K, Ketuvim, do you know what that means? Writings. Writings. Right? To this day, that's what they call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. If you read at the bottom here, it says Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim in Hebrew. All the way to this day, they still call the Old Testament this. In 180 BC, this guy says that his grandfather studied the law, Torah, the prophets, the Nevaim, and the other books, the writings. Right? It's the same classification. Right? Law, prophets, other books. He says this in 180 BC. That means that we can say with confidence that it seems like not only was the Old Testament completed at this time period, but the people recognized it as completed at this time period, and they even had it classified in the same way that we have it classified to this day at this time period. But we could actually push it even further back, can't we? Because who does he say studied it? His grandfather. His grandfather. Well, how much older is your grandfather than you? What, 50 years? Yeah, about 50 years. Right? 16. Okay, so you push that back. His grandfather growing up, it says that he devoted himself to the reading of these, and he'd acquired proficiency in them. So his grandfather devoted a lot of time, which means probably from his childhood, he had been studying these. And he doesn't say anything about this being like hot off the press. Oh, yeah, he studied this new collection of books. He makes it sound like his grandfather did what Jewish people regularly did, right? His grandfather studied the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Old Testament, which means that at 180 BC, and Malachi was only finished in 400 BC, right? So that's 220 years. But then you can push back even earlier, right? If his grandfather was growing up in 230 BC, well, he's studying it then. But the idea is that the grandfather is doing what they'd already been doing for a while. And so you're getting really close to the time period that Malachi has finished, that the Jewish people are recognizing the law, the prophets, and the writings. They're recognizing not only the books, but they're sectioning them off in the same way that we section them to this day. Mm -hmm. So Sirach references three categories of books, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, and tells us that his grandfather devoted time to studying these books. This would seem to suggest the Jewish people recognized the canon to be closed well before 180 BC, maybe even pushing back to 250 or 300 BC. Right? That's really cool, because that's like within 100 years of all this stuff happening. That's really unique. But we move on. Uh, there's this guy named Josephus, right? Uh, Y'all heard of Josephus, maybe? Uh, his name is Josephus Flavius, or Flavius Josephus. Uh, he was a Jewish historian, super useful. Uh, but basically, shortly after the time of Jesus, right? First century, AD. Um, there was this Jewish revolt against the Romans, right? The Jewish people finally said, we've had enough. And they decided to revolt against the Romans. And do you know how this went? Did it go poorly or well for the Jews? Yes, it did. It went really badly, right? Basically, the Jewish people revolted against the Romans, and the Romans squashed them, right? As a result, in 70 AD, um, the Romans came in, they totally destroyed Jerusalem, they leveled the temple, and up until 1948 AD, 
literally less than 100 years ago, Israel was not a nation, right? So for almost 2,000 years, Israel was not a nation as a result of what happened in this Jewish-Roman war. Josephus was a Jewish general in this revolt who surrendered, right? He realized that things were not going well. He surrendered. He kind of defected to the Roman side. And the Romans, who valued history, actually hired Josephus to go and write historical records of the Jewish people. So Josephus, in the first century, shortly after the time of Jesus, he writes an intense history of the Jewish people called the Antiquities of the Jews. In addition to this, Josephus writes other useful information as well. In this one letter called Against Apion, where he's writing against somebody, uh, basically defending the Jewish faith, this is what he says. For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us, disagreeing from and contradicting one another as the Greeks have, but we have only 22 books which contain the records of all the past times, which are justly believed to be divine. And of them, five belong to Moses, which contain his laws and the traditions of the origin of mankind till his death. This interval of time was little short of 3,000 years. But as to the time from the death of Moses till the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, who reigned after Xerxes, um, that's Xerxes was the king during the book of Esther, also known as Ahasuerus, the prophets who were, written, who were after Moses wrote down what was in their times in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. All right, there's some interesting information here, right? This is the first century AD, right? Just a few decades after the time of Christ. And Josephus, he starts off by saying, we do not have an innumerable multitude of books among us, right? So he says, us Jewish people, we have a fixed canon, right? We have a closed list of books, disagreeing from and contradicting one another as the Greeks have. Right? So he says this closed book list of books that we have, they do not contradict one another. They are consistent with one another. Right? So he's acknowledging like the whole prophetic and consistency test thing that we've talked about. Right? Uh, and he puts these in contrast to the books that the Greeks and the Romans have. What's he probably alluding to? The writings. Yeah, well, but he's talking about Greeks and Romans. What, what's he specifically probably talking about? Yeah, Greek and Roman mythology. If you've ever studied this, you'll realize that it all contradicts, right? There's like five different birth stories for Aphrodite, right? And they all contradict. Like everybody will agree, oh yeah, there's this person named Aphrodite, but nobody can agree about how she was born. Same thing with Athena, right? So they have endless books with endless different stories that all contradict, and they don't care. Josephus says, not so with the Jewish people. We have a fixed list of books, and none of them contradict. But there's a problem here. How many books does he say they have? 22. 22. How many do we have in the Old Testament? 39. 39. It's not actually a problem. The reason why it's not a problem is because the Jewish people, even to this day, if you were to look at this Tanakh I have right here, they organize the books of the Old Testament differently than we do. Right? We have First and Second Samuel. Do you know what they have? Samuel. Samuel. We have First and oh, Second Kings. What do they have? Just kings. kings. We have First and Second Chronicles. What do they have? Chronicles. Chronicles. We have Ezra and Nehemiah. They have Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? It's one book. We have the 12 minor prophets. They have the book of the 12. Right? And so, like, they basically take the 12 minor prophets and they put them into one book. Right? So that Hosea is a different section from Joel, but they treat them as one book. Does that make sense? Yes. And so when you look at it, these 22 books he's talking about here are the same exact books as the 39 books we have in the Old Testament. Right? They just classify them a little bit differently, but it's the same content. And so in the first century, he says, yeah, we have a closed list of books. They don't contradict. And it's the 22 books that we have in our Old Testament. That's really cool. Because he also doesn't say that they just developed this. Right? He says, no, this is just how it is amongst Jewish people. Uh, it contains the laws and traditions. And he basically explains how it came to be. So Josephus, writing shortly after the time of Christ, identifies the Hebrew canon as consisting of 22 books, consisting of the same 39 books which number the Christian Old Testament. He likewise identifies these as being divine in nature, but that's not all he does. He continues talking, and this is what he says. It is true, our history hath been written since Artaxerxes very particularly, but hath not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there hath not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. And how firmly we have given credit to these books of our own nation is evident by what we do. For during so many ages, as have already passed, no one has been so bold as either to add anything to them, 
to take anything from them or to make any change in them. But it is because natural, but it has become natural to all Jews immediately and from their very birth to esteem these books to contain divine doctrines and to persist in them, and if occasion be willingly to die for them. Do you see how this is super helpful for us yes. from a canon perspective? What is he saying? He mentions the part where nobody can nobody has been bold enough to add, take away, or change them in any way. Absolutely. Yeah, it, let's just walk through this. It is true. So in the, in the last section, he said that basically the 22 books that they have date from the time of Moses to the time of Artaxerxes. Right? Artaxerxes, this is shortly after the time period of Esther. Right? And so he says that is the limit to the Old Testament canon, which is what we would agree. Right? Because Malachi and Esther are around the same time period. Esther might actually be a little bit later. Right? And so usually we would say the Old Testament ends at Malachi or Esther, right there, right? Josephus agrees. He says that is where our Old Testament canon comes from. We have 22 books, that's it. But, he says, it is true our history hath been written since Artaxerxes. So, he says, it's not that we've only ever written 22 books. He says, no, the Jewish people have written more than 22 books. And we've even continued writing since that time period. But... They have not been esteemed of the like authority with the former. So what does he say about them? They're not part of the canon. Well, yeah, he says, yeah, we've written other books, but the books that we've written since then have not been esteemed of the same level of authority as those other ones. So he acknowledges that there's something special about those 22 books, right? So the books of the Old Testament are different than any other books, right? So they continued writing, but the Jewish people recognized that something happened after that time period that suggested that the canon had come to a close. And you have to ask yourself, well, what was it that they recognized had happened? And he says, there hath not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. There's his answer, right? Okay, well, the reason why the Old Testament came to a close is because prophets disappeared off the face of the planet, right? All of a sudden, Malachi, he finished his stuff up and God went silent. Right? From the time of Moses until then, there were always prophets. Right? There was always somebody doing something. Right? There was Moses, and there was Joshua, and then there was the period of the judges, and then you got to Samuel, and then you got to David, and you got to all these other prophets. Right? But then, after the time of Artaxerxes, God went silent. And so, yes, other books were written, but those books are not the same level of authority as the other books. This is why I wouldn't include the apocryphal books. Uh, in my Bible, right? Like, so Catholics would include the apocryphal books in their Bible. Well, I don't esteem those are the same authority. Because if you look at the historical records, the people are saying, no, us Jewish people, we recognize that the prophets, something happened there, right? After the time of Artaxerxes, there's no more prophets, right? They went silent. There was no more succession. And how firmly we have given credit to these books of our own nation is evident by what we do. So he says, if you want to see how highly we esteem the 22 books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, just look at what we do. For during so many ages, as I've already passed, no one has added anything to them, taken anything from them, or changed them. So he says, in all the generations, we have never altered anything. That's really useful for us. Yes. Right? Because he's saying we don't we don't edit these things. We don't change them. We treat them as the word of God. But it has become natural to all Jews immediately and from their very birth to esteem these books to contain divine doctrines. So he's saying, the reason we don't add or change anything is because from a young age, for generations, we have always taught people that these are the words of God, not of man. And therefore, they are to be treated carefully, authoritatively. They're not to be changed. They're not to be treated haphazardly. No, you have to take care in how you treat these things. So we esteem them to contain divine doctrines and to persist in them, and if occasion, be willing to die for them. He's saying we care about the Old Testament scriptures so highly that we would be willing to die for these things. Right? That is how highly we esteem them. That's really useful, useful information for us. Because this is what Josephus is saying about his time period, which is about 40 generations after the time period of Jesus. And he's making this as a blatant. Like, he's not saying this is what I believe. He's saying this is what we as Jewish people believe, right? So this is what Jesus believed. This is what the people before Jesus believed. He says for generations, this is how we have taught it, 
right? We have taught people that the prophets died off at the time of Artaxerxes. And he says that up until his day, we haven't treated anything to that level of esteem. You have to realize Josephus was not a Christian, and so he didn't hold to the New Testament. But he's saying for the Jewish people, the Old Testament canon was it. So Josephus asserts that there was a certain cultural awareness that the time period of the prophets ended at the time of Artaxerxes, around 450 BC, thus bringing the canon to a close. Thus, although other books have been written, they are not elevated to the same authority as the prophetically inspired materials. Uh, we also, if we look at the New Testament, we see evidence for this. In addition to making 300 plus references to the Old Testament, the New Testament itself testifies to the existence of a closed canon. Uh, we have to realize the New Testament would actually be external evidence um, for the Old Testament canon because it is a separate source. Uh, and even ignoring the New Testament's divine inspiration aspect, if you just treat it as a historical source, it gives us information for how the Old Testament canon was viewed. Right? Jesus himself, uh, he's rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees, and he says this, On account of this, behold, I, Jesus, am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. This information might seem not very important to us at first glance, but the context will shed light on this, right? So basically what's been happening at this time period, this is Matthew chapter 23. This is just a few chapters before Jesus dies, right? The rejection of Jesus is increasing. This is his final week, um, like in Jerusalem, and he is getting into heated arguments with the scribes and the Pharisees, and right here he is indicting them, right? He's rebuking them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he's telling them that basically they've been rejecting him and his people. And as a result, they are going to kill him. And as a result of killing him, the blood of all the righteous blood, like all the righteous blood shed on earth will be their guilt. Right? They are going to be guilty of that. And he says the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah. What is the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Genesis. Who is the first person murdered in the Bible? Abel. Abel. Okay. Now, true, mm-hmm. yeah, so from an Old Testament, from a Christian perspective, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Malachi. But from a Jewish perspective, it's actually a different book. They, or, like this Tanakh right here, is organized differently. If I flip to the end of the Tanakh, the last book is not Malachi, but it is Chronicles, right? They actually put First and Second Chronicles at the very end of their um, Hebrew Bible, right? And so they go from not Genesis to Malachi. They go Genesis to Chronicles, and Malachi is in between. But if you go to the end of Chronicles, do you know who the last person killed there is? Zechariah, Zechariah son of Berechiah. And so whenever Jesus says this, he is looking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and he says, by your rejection of me, The blood of all the righteous people slain on earth in the entire scriptures will fall on you. Why? Because they're the ones who studied the scriptures, right? They had studied the Old Testament from beginning to end, and they should have known better, but they still rejected Jesus, right? And so Jesus' indictment of the religious leaders spans the entirety of scripture. He asserts that they bear the responsibility of all those who were martyred for their faith from the first to the last. This is important. Right? Because it tells us that not only was the Old Testament completed, but it would seem to suggest that even in Jesus' day, the way they studied it was in the way that Jewish people study it to this day. Right? It was structured in the same way. Right? Genesis to Chronicles. Right? It wasn't just structured in some other way. No, he says, Abel to Zechariah. Right? Genesis to Chronicles. All of that is on you. Um, if he were to, like, if it was to be structured how the Christian Bible is structured, well, then there'd probably be somebody else who was martyred in one of the prophets or something like that. But he doesn't do that. It's from Genesis to Chronicles. That's really cool. And then, we need to talk about the Apocrypha a little bit, right? I mentioned how uh, there are some Christian sects that would hold to other books in the Bible, right? Uh, and these books would be called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanon. Um, and we don't. Right? So a ca- Catholics, they will have books like, um, they will have like Sirach, and they will have First and Second Maccabees, and they will have all these different books 
uh, in their canon, but they would distinguish between these books and the other books. But there's a reason why, as Protestants, we don't include those. And I've already kind of addressed that from Josephus' perspective, but what I want to do is I want to actually look at what the Apocrypha claims for itself. Because the Apocrypha itself acknowledges that it was written during a time period when the prophetic voice had ceased, while likewise anticipating a future wherein the prophetic voice would speak again. We see this in the book of 1 Maccabees. Um, the Maccabees were basically these like celebrities of Jewish culture, right? So about, like in about 200 BC, what happened is that um, there were these people named the Seleucids who were kind of oppressing the people of Israel. Very similar to how the Romans oppressed Israel at the time period of Jesus, right? That's what the Seleucids were doing. And finally, this one family had enough, right? The Maccabee family. And they led this huge revolt. It was called the Maccabean Revolt. And they successfully kicked the pagans out of the land, right? And as a result of kicking the pagans out of the land, they hopped on their donkeys. They rode into Jerusalem as people waved palm branches, welcoming them in. Imagery that is picked up when Jesus enters Jerusalem. They go into the city and they rededicate the temple and the entire city to God. This gives birth to a new feast in the land of Israel called the Feast of Dedication, which to this day is known as... Communion. Nope. Oh, Feast of Booths, I'm guessing? Nope. Feast of Booths is an Old Testament thing. Okay. The Feast of Dedication is the Feast of Hanukkah. Right? Whenever Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah, they are celebrating what the Maccabees did. Right? That is what the book of Maccabees is about. It tells this story. In 1 Maccabees, which was written just a little bit after this whole Maccabean revolt thing, somebody is writing down what happened. And in 1 Maccabees chapter 9, written about 150 BC, the person says this. So there was great distress in Israel, such has not been since the time a prophet had last appeared among them. Why is that significant to us when it comes to figuring out stuff about the canon? Because it shows that, um, I think what it's saying is that since Malachi was finished, there, was, there wasn't another prophet. Yeah, so it doesn't say anything about Malachi, but you are on the track, right track there. The person writing Maccabees acknowledges that there has not been a prophet in Israel for a really long time. He's writing this at 150 BC, right? And so he's saying, it's been a long time since there's been a prophet, right? Which would probably suggest 100, if not 200, if not more years, right? He's saying it's been a while since there's been a prophet, which also implies that the guy writing Maccabees is not what? No, it, well, yes, but it, he's not what? He's not a prophet. He's not a prophet, oh. right? The guy writing this is not claiming to be a prophet. He says that he is writing in a time period where there haven't been prophets for a long time. But what is the requirement to write a book of the Bible? To be a prophet. You have to be a prophet, mm -hmm. right? You have to be somebody who's being divinely inspired by God to write this stuff down. The guy who's writing Maccabees isn't claiming that. Right? And Josephus agreed with that. Remember, Josephus said, yeah, we've written books since then documenting what happened, but there hasn't been a prophetic voice. He's probably talking about books like Maccabees. Because right? the guy writing Maccabees, he is writing something down that is a historical record that I think we should study. But I don't esteem the book of Maccabees as the same level as Genesis or Isaiah or Hosea or something like that. Because the guy himself writing this, doesn't just, he doesn't view himself as writing that. Whenever Samuel wrote his stuff, he put it right next to the Torah, and everybody treated it as authoritative, right? Whenever Daniel was studying Jeremiah, he was treating it as authoritative, and he was using it to discern the future. The guy writing Maccabees, he's not claiming to be writing on behalf of God. He's simply saying, no, like, I'm writing during a time period when there haven't been prophets for hundreds of years. So he recognizes that something happened hundreds of years ago where the prophetic voice came to an end. That's consistent with what Josephus said. But then... If you keep reading a little bit later on in Maccabees, after they win their whole revolt thing, um, this is what he says. The Jews and their priests have resolved that Simon, Maccabee, right, one of the leaders of the family, that Simon should be their leader and high priest forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise. So what is he saying there? Is Simon like Simon Peter? No, this is Simon Maccabee, right? Oh. It's one of the Maccabees. 
Exactly, right? So the guy writing Maccabees is acknowledging that the Jewish people at 150 BC recognized that they were living in this limbo state, right? Where they knew that prophets had not been around for a while, but at the same time, they recognized that prophets were going to show up again, right? That's really cool because that's exactly consistent with what we see with the Old Testament and New Testament. And so they said, we appointed Simon Maccabee to be a priest and a king for us until a trustworthy prophet should arise. Mm -hmm. That's actually really cool because if you think about it, what are the three primary like offices of authority that we see in the Old Testament? Prophet, priest, king. So he says Simon Maccabee is going to be functioning as a priest king until a prophet can show up to replace him. So if somebody shows up to replace him, that person is going to be what? Prophet. A prophet? A priest and a king. Ultimately, <laughs> Jesus is going to be the prophet, priest, king, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you read the book of Hebrews, that's what it's about, right? And so that's what this guy's kind of acknowledging. Like unintentionally, I think he almost is prophesying, but he's not claiming to be. Right. He's just like he's not making a prophecy to where this is not a sign. He's just yeah. interpreting the scriptures, right? He's saying when you study the Old Testament scriptures. There was this promise that a prophet like Moses would arise, yeah. and you should listen to him like you listen to Moses. Well, Moses functioned in many ways kind of like a priest king, right? He functioned like a priest, even though he wasn't, like, like he was Aaron's brother and stuff, but he kind of functioned like a priest for the people. And he was the king before there was a king. Well, that's what the guy in Maccabees is writing. He's like, yeah, the Old Testament anticipates this future prophet, priest, king dude is going to show up. And when that guy shows up, He's going to kick off this new thing. Until then, we've put somebody in charge because we're just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so, we can say with confidence that the Hebrew canon was organized and fully recognized by the Jewish population hundreds of years before the time of Christ. Uh, and the Apocrypha, it just doesn't claim to be on that same level. I, I would encourage you to read the Apocrypha. Uh, I, need, I still need to read a lot of it. I've read much of it, just I haven't read the whole thing. Um, I would encourage you to read it, study it. It's got some interesting stuff. If anything, it'll just teach you what the Jewish people believed at that time period. Just don't base your beliefs off of it. Right. Right? Because it's just a book. Like, it's kind of like if I went and wrote a book. I hope you read it. But if my book contradicts scripture, you err on the side of scripture. Same thing with the Apocrypha. Right? And I, and I don't think that's just me speaking from a Protestant perspective. I'm saying if you read the Apocrypha, that's what it claims for itself. The Jewish people at that time period recognized they were living in this limbo state where the Old Testament was completed and they were waiting for this new like, rise of more prophets, right? Prophets had ceased, but prophets were going to return. And that's written about halfway between the Old and New Testament, right? They recognize that this was the state. And so um, that's just really cool for us. So when you look at the internal and external evidence, I think you have really good evidence to conclude that um, the Old Testament that we have today is the Old Testament we are meant to have. And so let's summarize this. Firstly, there is nothing that explicitly tells us how the canon was developed, right? This is what I told you right off, like fr from the start, the very beginning, there's nothing that tells us. That'd be super helpful, but there isn't. The closest thing we have is Josephus, where Josephus says, hey, we've got stuff from Moses, Moses to Artaxerxes, and Moses wrote these, and then these guys wrote these, and these guys wrote these, but he doesn't really tell us when people received these. But I don't think we should be surprised by that, because it seems like it was just pretty organic. As best we can tell, the books were written down and accepted as inspired and authoritative almost immediately after being produced, not simply orally translated as many claim. Uh, if it were anything other than this, we would expect to find evidence of that, right? So the lack of evidence would actually suggest that they were just written down and received immediately, right? If not, then you would expect to have people debating about it and being like, oh, how, how do we receive this stuff? But instead, it just seems like as books were being written, the Jewish people just recognized, all right, this is authoritative, let's add it to the list, right? That's just how it was treated. Uh, thirdly, the Old Testament as we know it was recognized as scripture by the Jewish people by 180 BC, right? Uh, I would actually argue for earlier than that, um, because if you remember the book of Sirach, that was 180 BC, 
Um, but I also argued we could push before then. I argued that we could probably push to maybe 250 BC, if not even earlier to 300 BC. Uh, the reason why I chose 180 BC here is because I like to be conservative with my dates. Um, I would rather us understate our case rather than overstate it. Uh, I see a lot of well-meaning Christians who will just like in their zeal for like showing how dependable the Bible is, they will just like overstate things out of the wazoo. I don't think that that does us any favors. I think we should be conservative and just, you know, basically give the skeptics as much room as you can. Right? Give them the strongest argument possible because I think even if you give them the strongest argument, we still come out on top. And so, sure, 180 BC. Let's say that hypothetically Sirach was lying and his grandfather never studied that stuff and that the law of the prophets and the writings were only recognized that year and he just made it up and wrote it. Okay, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, ultimately, I don't care when it was recognized. I don't care if the Old Testament wasn't recognized by the Jewish people until yesterday. Uh, because from my perspective, the main thing that makes something canonical is whether or not it was from God, right? That's what I'm mainly concerned with. But I think whenever you actually examine the evidence, we have evidence to um, back up the claim that it was recognized very early on. Josephus cites 22 books, which equate to the 39 of the Old Testament. Josephus and the Apocrypha acknowledge that the prophetic voice went silent after the time of Malachi. The Apocrypha and the New Testament section the Old Testament into its modern categories, law, prophet, writings. Uh, and the New Testament quotes it over 300 times. I didn't even mention that when we were breaking it down. But the New Testament does talk about the, um, you know, where it'll say Jesus interpreted for them the law and the prophets and stuff like that. So where it'll section it off in the same way. Uh, unlike many Old Testament texts, the Apocrypha never claims to be divinely inspired. Right? Moses will explicitly say, thus says the Lord. Isaiah will say, thus says the Lord. Samuel will write stuff down and put it next to the Ark of God. The Apocrypha doesn't do that. The Apocrypha write stuff down, but they never claim to be on the same level as the scriptures. The earliest scriptures provide a litmus test for determining whether future prophetic revelations came from the one true God. Uh, and as a result, we can conclude that texts were not haphazardly accepted. Jews did not take false prophecy lightly. You can be killed for it um, whenever they're being faithful. Sometimes they would take it lightly, but that's because they were being tempted by false prophecy. Uh, and prophetic evidence supports the Old Testament canon. Even in circumstances where information is lacking, we can trust they had good reasons for accepting texts as canonical. And so, with our final few minutes, let's arrive at some conclusions that we can say going forward. Uh, and, and I also just want to remind you, uh, for the New Testament, we'll go a little bit slower uh, because there's a lot more evidence that we can cover, and it's also just a lot more exciting, I would say. Uh, whereas with the Old Testament, since we're dealing with such a small community of people who are mainly living in the same region... We just don't have as much evidence to go off of because the different ways that they went about discerning whether or not these were true were things that probably wouldn't be written down. Um, but by the time you get to the New Testament, writing has become such a commonplace thing that we do have written evidence of this. Whereas most likely they were just like having conversations about this for the in Old Testament time period. So firstly, the Old Testament canon started to exist the moment it was written. Um, what definition of canon am I using whenever I say that? Um, the one that starts with an E. Nope. George said it a second ago under his breath. Ontological. Ontological. Oh. Right? That's the ontological definition of canon because it's by the very nature of it, right? The Old Testament canon started to exist. The one was written because it's from God, right? It doesn't matter whether or not people are using it that way. Um, like during that time period, whenever the people of Israel had abandoned the Torah and had forgotten about it, and it was just gathering dust in the back of the temple. Does that mean that the Torah had ceased to be canon? Apparently not, because whenever the king reads it, he rips his clothes. Because it's not like God was like, oh, well, they're not using it as canon, and therefore it's not canonical. No, it is canonical just because it is from God. And therefore, it began to exist as soon as it was written, whether or not it was being used that way or not. Right? It is canonical because it is from God. Secondly, man's discovery and acceptance of that canon unfolded over time. What definitions of canon are those? Uh, functional and the exceptional. Uh, exclusive, exclusive. exclusive okay. Yeah, it, it's the other two, right? The functional and exclusive. That took time. So it began to exist immediately because it was inspired by God, but it did take time for man to recognize this. The cool thing is that from our evidence, it doesn't seem like it took that much time, right? It didn't seem like it doesn't seem like it took hundreds of years. It was like basically as, as long as it took for Moses to write it down and present it to the people. That's how long it took, 
right? And then they began to use it and treat it as authoritative and just recognize that it was canonical. Thirdly, the legitimacy of the Old Testament canon was built on prophetic authority. I'm restating this stuff, but that's just because we're coming to conclusions here. Um, so the, the thing that makes something canonical versus non-canonical is whether or not it is from a legitimate prophet. This does not mean that every single prophet wrote a book, right? There's a lot of prophets who we see in the Bible who just never wrote books, right? Elijah, Elisha, neither of them wrote books, right? There's a guy named Micaiah, probably one of my favorite prophets, never wrote a book. They're mentioned in books of the Bible, but they didn't write ones themselves. So there are prophets, so we can distinguish between literary prophets and non-literary prophets, right? Non-literary ones, they just never wrote anything. Literary prophets, those are the ones where we get books of the Bible, and so we would say that there have been 66 books that have come from literary prophets, Old and New Testament. But when we use the, talk about the New Testament, we usually focus on the apostles, not just prophecy in general. Um, fourthly, the Jewish people were not haphazard in their approach to Scripture. Uh, the main reason we need to highlight that is because we don't have evidence for exactly how these books were received. Right? For, like, for instance, the book of Job. There is nothing in the book of Job where somebody gives like a prophetic test that is authenticated, right? We don't even know who wrote the book of Job. But since we know that the Jewish people were not haphazard in their reception of scripture, and since we do have evidence for how they received some of them, we can just take it by faith that they had a reason for accepting Job, even if we don't have that reason. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So there's some of it we have to take by faith because we just don't have the evidence they did. We have good reason to believe that they probably had reason to accept it, they probably knew who wrote it down, and they probably knew that it was from God, but we don't have that evidence. And so it's good for us to know that they were not haphazard in that. They took it very seriously so that we can trust that they were um, confident in the books that ultimately ended up there. Though we don't have all the details, the information we do have gives us confidence and trusting that we have all the correct books, no more, no less, in the 39 books of the Old Testament canon. So there is... The internal and external evidence of the Old Testament canon. Thank you for <laughs> listening to that. It is 7.59, which means that I ended right on time. Uh, next week, we'll begin discussing the New Testament canon, and I'm probably going to try to break that up into two weeks, if not more. Uh, yes? What was the last slide I wanted to write? I don't think. Okay. We have all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next week, we will uh, go into the New Testament canon. It will be a good time, uh, and... They will have a lot of good stuff to talk about. Right. Uh, but do one of y'all want to pray for us real quick to close this out? I can do it. All right, go for it. Dear Lord, um, thank you for uh, us gathering here and discussing this information together. And I pray that as we go forward, we will, we will remember this and apply it to our own lives and keep in mind who you are. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.